Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, and today we're going to be reviewing my 1965 Plymouth Barracuda. Uh, as promised from last time, uh, I did actually record an entire review of this entire car, the, the whole thing, driving everything. And unfortunately, I lost all that footage <laughs> for reasons. So, you guys, I hope you guys liked the dart review I did in the last video. And now we're going to review this bad boy. So, let's get started. Alright guys, so as I said, we're going to review this car real quick here. Once again, it is a 1965 Plymouth Barracuda. It is essentially the first smaller cars that Chrysler produced at the time. So back then, uh, you're talking about early 60s, 61, 62, Chrysler produced a vehicle called the Valiant. And now the Valiant is what underpins that chassis is called an A-body chassis, and that chassis is what underpins this vehicle. So just like the last video, the, the Dodge Dart, that's an A-body, this is an A-body, although it's a little earlier, so it's a generation before that car. Okay, and the A-body, again, is the value lower-end car of the time, right, to compete with, like, the Ford Falcon or the Corvair from from Chevrolet, you know, or the Chevy 2, essentially. So let's address the hood real quick. That is an aftermarket hood. Uh, that comes from a company called VFN. Now that company produces uh, fiberglass body pieces for race cars primarily. Um, and the reason that hood is like that, I'll show you in a little bit more detail why, why it's like that, but A, it looks cool, right? So that's really cool. But the other thing is it, it's for clearance purposes. Uh, I had to do a few adjustments underneath the hood. I'll show you what I mean by that in a little bit later, but let's take a look at the exterior, the full exterior of this thing. Of course, we got the single headlights on each side. We got the side markers that kind of look like driving lights, but they're right there in the middle where the grill's at. We've got a grill in the middle here that sort of bisects everything. Let's see here, let's come around the side. Of course, it's got the V8 badge, as it should. This actually came with a V8 uh, from the factory. This vehicle you could get with either a Slant 6 or a V8 at the time in 1960 through 64 through 66. You could either get a Slant 6 or a V8. Uh, the V8's available for this car, just like the Dart, was the 273 uh, or 4.5 liter V8. And that V8 could be had in two different uh, versions. You could either have the one that has this emblem here, which is a V8. It's a two-barrel, right? So the low-performance engine. And the other one was a four-barrel, and that would give you a different emblem, which was a circle with an S, and it was called the Formula S, obviously. And that's for the sportier four-barrel. I think produced about 270 horsepower, something like that. Um, this thing in the drivetrain, either a three-speed stick shift, a four-speed stick shift, or a uh, three-speed automatic, which is what this has right now. And... Um, when these first were introduced in 1964, if you got an automatic, you got a push-button transmission. And those things were pretty interesting and pretty cool in itself. But anyway, as you can see the roof line, the famous Barracuda roof line that ends in this beautiful rear window. Look at the size of this thing. Wow. Isn't that pretty cool? And then, of course, we got these speakers. Now, I'll talk more about these speakers when we get into the interior of the car. Let's go back out a little bit. We got... These wheel arches, there's actually um, a debate of whether or not the reason this car wasn't more popular when it was introduced is because of the wheel well back here, the way this opening is. I kind of like it. I don't know. I think it's pretty good, but let's move on to the back here. As you can see, the rear end tapers off real nicely to this tail light. So these are these tail lights. These are just one single bulb tail light. They look pretty cool. Now, these backup lights, these lenses, those are actually off of a early 60s Impala. Now, the reason they're on there is when I got this car roughly five years ago, it came with one of these kind of hanging off of it. I think someone was trying to fit them on there or something because the original ones are actually sort of flat. So instead of this bubble here, you see like a little flat piece. Now, I thought this looked pretty cool on these. I thought it looks, honestly, in my opinion, it looks better than the originals. A little work to get them in there, but it worked. It did, went in there pretty good, and I think they look pretty cool. It kind of gives that retro sort of style to it. Let's see here. So now that's an interesting emblem right there. You see this emblem here? That is the Valiant or Plymouth Valiant emblem back in the early 60s. So to put that in the context, back in the early 60s, Valiant was supposed to be its own brand, its own mark, so to speak. It was supposed to be like Scion or something. And that was supposed to introduce a whole line, a whole host of 
value vehicles, you know, uh, stuff that was less expensive, but still reliable, still presentable, that kind of thing. And so that was going to be their emblem, you know. And so that's supposed to represent the V for Valiant, obviously, but still in keeping with the front of that Plymouth, you know, the, the Plymouth boat, which is what this whole thing's about. The old Plymouth logo was a boat. So this here is supposed to represent the front of that boat. But anyway, I'm getting carried away with that. Obviously, we have a little trim piece here that's supposed to represent like a vent that comes through. And in reality, there is a vent in there. So inside the car, in there, there's uh, a couple of vents, and I'll show you this in a little bit. But there's a flap back here that opens. And so what happens is when you open the front end vents, air is supposed to travel over the inside of the top of this roof all around everyone to ventilate you. And then there's these flaps that are supposed to flap open with the force of that air to kind of provide sort of a flow through ventilation system. Whether it worked or not, I don't know. It doesn't really work uh, in this instance, or at least how I have it here. A few touches I did myself as far as that fuel filler, that actually does not come with the car. So this actually pops open. It's supposed to represent like a, like a, you know, one of those racing caps and you know, quick pop and you put in the fuel and it's supposed to be like a racy type of thing. Um, I have this other one here just because, you know, that gasket's seen better days. So I just put a different cap here so it'll seal correctly. I don't smell any fumes, but it works real nice. That was an interesting add on. Oh yeah, and uh, these wheels. Now these wheels are really cool. These are supposed to be uh, representative of a wheel that existed back in the mid 60s called the radar wheel. Now the radar wheel had these spokes as you can tell they look kind of like shields or something. These are very period correct. Um, they're really cool. They, I think they set the car off really nice and they really work well with those red lines around them and I think they look really good. As you can tell the car has a few blemishes. It's got a few dings and bangs and stuff and I mean this is a work in progress you know. I haven't completely uh, restored the vehicle I'm working on it but as we all know that takes time money and I don't have much of either so <laughs> I'm working on it anyway so like I said that's the overall styling of the vehicle I think it's pretty cool looking I like it. it's real nice now this mirror here as you'll notice there's no other mirror on that side and believe it or not in those years and early on in this lifetime of these vehicles they only came with one rear mirror on the door didn't have two of them like modern cars do because it wasn't required. The cars only, only only had to have two mirrors. So it's this one and the one in the middle there. And we'll look at that one a little bit. Let's take a look at the engine real quick and see what we got in here. So here it is, guys. This is the beast that powers this thing. It's a 318 cubic inch engine. Uh, it's related to the 273 that's in the Dart, as I talked about in the last video. Now, these engines here uh, were the evolution of that engine. It's uh, for you metric guys, it's a 5.2 liter. And so this engine uh, was originally in two other cars. Uh, my other car was a 83 Chrysler Cordova, which um, for reasons that I'll get into later, uh, ended up having to be scrapped. And so that, you know, went in here. But also that engine was originally in my dad's car. So my dad's first car was a 74 Plymouth Satellite, which had this engine here. This engine then went into my aunt's car, which was the Chrysler Cordova that I had for a little while. And now it's in this thing. So it's actually, this engine's outlived three cars almost. This thing is very reliable. And I haven't done a whole lot to it. I mean, it's been rebuilt about the one time before I had it. And all I've done is kind of dressed it up. It looks nice. At least I think it looks really nice. Um, and I did a few performance things to it. It does have fuel injection. Um, it has electronic ignition system. And they both actually talk to each other so that I can control it from the inside. I'll show you guys in that in a second. So... Let's get into the topic of why I got this hood here. Now, this hood, as you'll notice, has that scoop in there, right? Now, this provides an extra three inch of clearance. Why do I need that? Well, you see these exhaust manifolds here, those things? Those are actually meant for a pickup truck, a 1992 Dodge Ram pickup truck with a 5.2 liter in it. So that's why these things fit in here. Like I said, this engine didn't change for a long time. They had these out for a very long time. Um, and you'll see down in there, you see that's a steering box right there. Well, that exhaust system does not quite fit under these things. It wasn't designed for it. So I had to lift the whole thing up because I didn't have any other exhaust for this. About an inch and a half. Well, that was just enough for this whole thing not to fit underneath the hood. Well, I had to find a solution for it. And I didn't really want to cut up my hood that I had for this car, the original one. So I found this hood online and I, you know, purchased it. And so now we have that solved. And I think it looks pretty cool. Um, in keeping with the modernization of this vehicle, I did go with electric fan. It works pretty good. 
Um, I did put a different type of alternator, so now it runs on 120 amps, much like a modern car. And primarily I did that is so that the fuel injection under there actually functions correctly and how it should at idle. There's no drop in voltage. These original alternators only had about 75, maybe 68 amps out of them. So they, they weren't really meant to run electronics and stuff. So I upgraded that. And then we do have a radiator similar to the one that's on the Dart for pretty much the same reason. The original ones are stupid money for, and they don't really even cool off that much. And this, you know, it's an aluminum, it's upgraded radiator and it costs, you know, a fraction of the, of the price. So why wouldn't I upgrade that? Just like the Dart, this is very bare bones. I did, like I said, have to custom do a few things to get this to work. Um, there's a lot of pieces in here that are actually off of previous cars of mine. The, this thing is the embodiment of a budget build. Budget build, sorry. Uh, I've had a lot of these pieces laying around for a long time. Just to give you context, I've probably put a total of about four thousand dollars in this entire build. That includes the purchase of this vehicle. Uh, just to get to this point, most of the time you're looking at about eight thousand dollars just to get it to run right. Any any project that you come across. So, you know, I think I'm doing pretty good, right? But anyway, so that's a quick overview of the engine. Like I said, there's not a whole lot here. This whole combination of the engine and the automatic transmission probably works to like, eh, I want to say 280, maybe 300 horsepower. But to the wheels, because this transmission slips a lot, um, these are old school automatic transmissions. And so the, the torque converter, which is what transfers power from the engine into the transmission, slips a ton. And so all that slipping, Adds for good torque, good good launch control, but for, for what it's worth, it really just produces about 150, maybe 160 horsepower to the wheel, which kind of sounds low, but honestly, it's not so much how much power this thing's making, it's how it feels on the road. Whatever. You know what? This is the internet. Never mind. This thing makes 1,000 horsepower and uh, 900 foot-pounds of torque. Awesome. But that's it. If you guys have any more questions about the engine and about what powers it, let me know in the comments below, and let's move on to the interior, right? All right. So... Before we move on, guys, I wanted to show you a few upgrades I did do to the exterior of this. Um, you see those those are now LED headlights. They used to be the sealed beam halogen lights with the uh, integrated high beam and low beam. Now it's got LEDs for better visibility. I do drive this as much as I can, night or daytime, so I want to be able to see, and these work fine. So let's see. Also, real quick, uh, in the suspension department, you can't see what's going on with this, but there are disc brakes in there now. Normally, these all came with drum brakes all around, uh, 11 inch in the front or 10 and uh, nine inch in the back. So these are now uh, disc brakes conversion uh, with the appropriate uh, master cylinder that's supposed to go in there and an upgraded suspension system with all the bushings and all that stuff in the front at least to, to make it handle the way it should uh, better than it used to actually, even from the factory. So, you know, a little bit better handling characteristics, but yeah, so let's move on to the interior. All right. so. As for the interior, like I said before, these things weren't meant to be super luxurious, opulent things. This is just basically a sporty looking uh, economy car, um, something for the youth, right, that they could afford and want to be driving in. We got our just your basic bucket seats, right, for sportiness. The rear seat actually folds down. Back in the day, these things, there wasn't really like a, a you know, designation for this. This was a fastback. Um, and if you get a car early enough, like an early Barracuda, they're sort of designated as sports wagons, believe it or not. So <laughs> that's pretty crazy stuff. But anyway, um, you can fold this down if you needed space or if you want to pretend you have a sports car for a day, right? We got the steering wheel, which again is a lot like the, the, the Dart. And this steering wheel, believe it or not, this steering wheel here, that is actually off of my first vehicle, which is a 1966 Dodge Charger. That car I had Back in the early 2000s, I drove that thing through high school. Uh, I rebuilt it with my father. I mean, that was awesome. And so I only ended up with this. I had actually taken this steering wheel off and put the original one on it because this is not the original wheel for that car. Um, I had found this and I liked it and it was a little more sporty, so I put it on that car. Well, I took it off to kind of set it back to, to old school and I ended up pretty much with this and that's it. That's all I ended up with that car. Sad, but it happens. All right, so... That dash, as you'll remember, that's the dash we're trying to replace that I'm working on on the other dash, the, the, the retrofitting of the new gauges. And this, this doesn't quite work the way it should. I mean, it kind of does, for example, the speedometer doesn't work. Um, and 
I'm pretty sure that the gas gauge doesn't work accordingly. However, um, the temperature and the uh, ammeter, sorry, gauge works perfectly. You'll see another gauge over there. That gauge is uh, for oil pressure and of course the tachometer in the middle. Although I don't quite need most of that because you'll see that controller down here. Now that controller actually does all the all the monitoring and controlling of the fuel injection system. What I mean by that is this thing allows me to regulate how much fuel goes into this, how much timing, how much everything really. It's really cool. It's a really interesting system. If you guys want to know more about that system, I'll go ahead and, and talk to you more about it and go over detail. But let me know in the comments below if you guys want to know more about that. But again, I mean, you don't get much. You get your headlight switch over here and your um, wiper switch. That's actually a... Um, a cigarette lighter. I got a little ball joint there for the uh, the phone holder, and of course a heater control because this does not have AC. And then someone at some point put a off the market stereo, which doesn't work because why would it? But um, and I added some cup holders just to have for because again this thing is used. I drive it quite a bit actually. Um, I don't have much of a headliner. I did do this kind of again. This falls under the theme that I'm going for. I'll talk about that in a sec. I'll get, I'm getting to it, guys. Get, give me a sec here. But I just want to give you an overview of the car for the most part, right? It's pretty spacious. And there's the door panel, the infamous abundant uh, cigarette uh, ash trays. So there's one there. There's one in the middle there. There's one over there. And then there's supposed to be two in the back here, one over here, one over there. I don't have those yet, but I will be getting them. And so yeah, uh, five, five ashtrays for a car that can hold five people, right? So five smokers, awesome. Okay, so now let's go over the theme of this thing. Oh, and real quick, I wanted to point out that these seats, these are not real falser. These are the original vinyl seats that came with this. Look, look at how pliable this is, this is insane. This thing's over 50 years old and I mean, it's in really good shape. It's, you don't see this very often. So I'm going to keep them like this for a little while, but I am going to re everything. Obviously, I'm going to put carpet because there, well, there is none. And there is no, like I said, no headliner really. And uh, I put records up there, uh, record sleeves, just because yeah, I thought it looked pretty cool, right? Not too bad. But um, yeah, so let's go over the, whole, the overarching theme of this car. I want to enjoy this car as much as I can while I have it, right? While it runs and all that stuff. And so I decided, you know what? What would be better than to take advantage of the way it is right now and sort of make something that a 70s or late 70s high school kid would have, like a hand-me-down car or he bought it used, right? And he's trying to build it, trying to, trying to make his own car out of it, right? He's personalized, but different hood, different wheels, you know, he's got the speakers in the back. Now, these speakers are symbolic to the older guys. The older guys will know what I'm talking about. Back then, there wasn't really much in the way of like aftermarket stereos. There just wasn't. Um, you got an 8-track play player, maybe, that you would add on the bottom. Maybe you got a cassette player, but that was it, AM radio, and that was the end of that. So the speakers, speaker technology wasn't get, it wasn't really that great at the time. So most of the time, what a lot of guys did was they would take their house speakers and they would throw them in the back of the car or on the seat if it fit, and they would hook them up to the stereo, and boom, you got noise, more noise. So I thought, you know what, since these were available to me by a buddy of mine, these are period correct. They are Sonic uh, speakers that belong in a house. And they look pretty cool. So I put them back here. And they're supposed to, like, again, it's the part of the theme. Part of that high school kid trying to do something with what he's got. And, you know, he's adding some personal touches, some performance things. And that's why the ceiling looks like this. Anyway, that's pretty much it for the car. There's not a whole lot going on here. Oh, yeah, one other thing that's pretty cool is before all of that, when in 64, when these things debuted, debutted, see this empty space right there? That empty space? So this space right there, that's actually meant, or originally meant for a push button transmission. Now the push button transmission uh, was where you controlled your automatic stuff, right? Back in, in the early 60s, late 50s, Chrysler was banking on this push button transmission. It was just an automatic transmission, but the, to control it, it had these series of buttons that controlled rods, that that would control a cable down into the transmission itself. The hilarious part is that uh, shifter assembly there controls the exact same 
a cable system as that push button. So it's pretty funny, pretty interesting. I mean, it worked fine, I guess, but you know, it, it, it was a weird setup and not everybody got used to it. So they moved on and they went back to regular old shifter knobs. But anyway, moving on. All right, guys, so that is it for the overview of my vehicle. Um, if you got more questions about what, what's in this thing, other uh, details you wanna know about it, let me know in the comments below and I'll explain more if you wanna know more about it, okay? Uh, but how about we go for a drive? was creating the Chrysler K platform or the K car platform not to be confused with the Japanese key cars after that Chrysler took a long time to return to rear-wheel drive cars this ironically represents the beginning of Chrysler's endeavor to s produce small two-door vehicles right uh, and this was small by the way at the time these were considered compact two-door cars and uh, you know, this car came out in a time when there wasn't such a thing as a Mustang yet. There wasn't a Camaro. There wasn't anything that was considered a pony car. By the way, pony car, if you guys don't know, was actually a derived term from the famed Mustang. It was so popular when it came out that, you know, they started referring to cars like it as pony cars. Um, so this actually debuted about two weeks right before that, on April 1st of 1964. And people were uh, like astounded that Plymouth produced this type of car. And the funny thing about it is when it came out, even though it had a different roof and everything, to most people, it was still a Valiant. It was still this economy car that no one really cared about. You just bought a Valiant, like I said earlier, for because you needed a car, because you needed wheels and, and an engine and it, it beat walking, you know what I'm saying? You had to really, kind of stretch your imagination to consider this thing uh, a sports car and the hilarious part is that Plymouth was actually aiming to capture the youth market with this car in sort of like well you, the youth like European cars European sports cars right why don't we go that route why don't we style it like it was a, a uh, European vehicle okay so let's make this sporty roof on our Valiant give it some like European-esque lines to the thing right and let's see if the youth market will actually like this car because again they didn't have a vehicle uh, that was aimed for only the youth there, there was no there was no sporty American car not really not a small one at least and yeah like the Corvette was around but that really wasn't aimed at the youth that was aimed at you know the rich guy you wanted a sports car yeah, you had a Chevy uh, Corvette but that was that was someone that had some money that could buy that thing. These were meant for people who didn't have that much money, you know? But they wanted that excitement, that, that fun. This was supposed to be their car. 
this was supposed to be the the vehicle that put Plymouth securely on the map we are the youth uh, market now we own the youth market with this vehicle that's what they were going for they had actually rushed their production because they found out about the Mustang and what was gonna happen with the Mustang and they said all right we're gonna rush this thing and they were actually going to produce a fairly different looking vehicle than this same roof line but slightly different body style they actually just ran out of time they wanted to beat Ford to market and in doing so they essentially made a rush job of a car and they created this thing it wasn't exciting enough especially not compared to the Mustang of the time you know when that came out it just took off they sold hundreds of thousands of those cars this could just simply not uh, keep up and this was starting to be lumped into kind of like the Corvair coupe right and it was sort of like okay that's cool you can get it sporty but it's basically the same thing it's a Valiant with a different roof on it just like the Corvair was the two-door was a sporty Monza but really it's just a two-door Corvair and at that time the Corvair was nothing more than an economy family car so that's kind of the history of this type of vehicle now as to why I have this vehicle again to reiterate I just wanted something slightly different I wanted something that was uh, going to appeal to my you know I like weird cars I like slightly different cars and this is a slightly different car what I mean by that is well it's a Barracuda you know actually when guys think of Barracuda they think of 1970 to 71 72 even Bar the, the Cuda the Plymouth Cuda the fire breathing hemi powered beast that could destroy anything at the track that's not this car that was never the intention of this car Hell, the term muscle car didn't even exist when this came out. They, did, they were still figuring all that stuff out. This is kind of aimed on a sportier feel, a little bit better handling. You had uh, the V8, but it wasn't the super powered V8. It was, you know, torquey, well balanced. Uh, it was, it had the handling to match. You could get brakes, fairly good brakes for the time. Um, this was European tour car of the day for an American car. Again, competing with the Europeans, right? That's what they thought the youth market wanted. There was no, there was still building that market in the in America. It handles pretty good though. It, I mean, after the upgrades, it runs really well. Yeah, it's sort of <laughs> derelict, and I still need to do a lot of work. But that's part of the fun, right? That, that's that's part of having your project car. I'm a car guy. I like doing this kind of stuff. I got the weird, you know, ceiling with the different record sleeves up there to cover up the fact that I don't have a ceiling yet. But I will eventually. The other thing to note about this car is that the thing I'm building is something that isn't a fire breathing muscle car. I had that before. I had a 66 Charger like I mentioned earlier. I've been there, done that. I, I you know, big old 383 cubic inch or a 6.6 .6 liter V8 you know with all kinds of 400 horsepower and all kinds of torque and that's cool and all I wanted something a little more balanced it's not exactly the same car that I've used I'm used to working with because it's so early in the production years of the, of the a body like I was saying earlier some of the things weren't quite right were quite figured out yet so I, I'm seeing all those quirks, all those things that, that that don't quite match up to what I'm used to. As far as power and performance goes, I mean, like I said, it probably has about 287 to 300 horsepower. This engine's kind of worn, you know, it's more than likely got like 200, I don't know, 80,000 miles on This thing's been through three cars. So, you know, it's, it's kind of up there in age, but I mean, look at this, it's, bring it down. <laughs> I mean, it still has power, a lot of power. Especially, I'm pretty sure that the fuel injection system has a lot to do with it and the way the, the tuning goes, right? I've, I've done a lot to tune this over the years, but works fine. The upgraded brakes are, you know, yes, they're still manual brakes, just like the Dart. Yes, it's still manual steering, but the, the brakes work fantastic over the drums that came with this thing. I mean, the brakes on the Dart were suggestive at best you know the uh this thing this actually breaks when you tell it to it's one of those things where like this actually does respond to your inputs as far as braking 
and steering and all that stuff. Yes, it's a little, you know, floaty still, even with the upgrades, but it's not as much. You know, it's, whereas the Dart was essentially a marshmallow trying to run a marathon, this is that same marshmallow if it went to the gym. You know, it's, it's kind of in that vein. It, it, for what it is, it handles very well. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it's all part of the upgrade process. These wheels, by the way, are a 15 inch wheel uh, by eight inch width. And they are, I think the tires on this are a 235 60R15. So, you know, it, it, they're bigger than these things would have come with. I actually have the original upgrades for this. There's a dealer option, you know, the, the nice wheels. Those were a 14 by seven and a half inch, something like that. So these 15 by eights are massive <laughs> compared to like what was available for this car at the time. As this sits, this probably weighs 2,500 pounds with me in it. So, you know, it's no slouch. And 300 horsepower on a vehicle that only weighs two and a half thousand pounds, that's a lively vehicle. Yes, it still has the original live axle in the back. Yes, it's hilarious as hell to turn around in a corner at full throttle. <laughs> but that's part of the fun, right? Uh, at this point, this would probably be a good drift car, honestly. Overall, I'd say I'm happy with this car what I'm actually building out of this thing. I got crazy plans for this car. One day, I'm gonna make something ridiculous out of this vehicle. I'm actually toying with the idea of putting the engine in the back where that window is. I know, I'm insane. But still, it's part of the deal, right? That's what car guys do. You build a concept in your head and that's what you don't work with. And I felt that this was a good platform to work off of. I don't know, you guys let me know what you guys think. If you guys have any other thoughts about my car, or want to know anything more about my car, let me know in the comments below and I'll go over those things. All right guys, so that was my review of my 1965 Plymouth Barracuda. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, let me know in the comments below if there's anything else that you wanted me to discuss, maybe other things that you wanted to know, maybe more things in detail that you wanted to find out about. Either way, that's, uh, that's it, so I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.